I'd like to call to order this committee the whole meeting of the Town of Sonogi Shores, and I'll extend a welcome to everyone that ventured out tonight. Our first order of business is a declaration of pecuniary interest, and I'll remind every member of your responsibility to do so. You can do so now or when it arises. There is no additions, deletions, or amendments to the agenda, so we slip to delegations. And our first delegation is Jeff Carver. He's here for representing the Port Elgin BIA for a Maple Syrup Festival. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you very much. I like the atmosphere in here when the, uh, when the gallery is a little uh, less full than another. It's less tense right now. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mayor, Council, for, uh, for having me here today. I will be fairly brief. Um, I'm here to talk about the Maple Syrup Festival that the Port Elgin BIA is planning on hosting in downtown Port Elgin on May or March 24th. Um, it will be a one-day event, and uh, I guess the thrust of my, my visit here is to answer any questions that, that you folks might have, um, ask for your assistance, um, involvement, and participation, ideally, in what uh, is shaping up to be an exciting festival. We've had our uh, initial meeting, uh, and, and, and it was quite exciting to see. Uh, it was very well attended, and uh, a lot of people that are very interested, including some folks that are sitting around the, the table here tonight, that want to get involved and participate and help build this into something that uh, hopefully we'll be enjoying in downtown Port Elgin for, for many years to come. Um, I guess, uh, like I said, the thrust of, of what I'm here for tonight is to ask for uh, a road closure. Uh, as well as some assistance uh, from, from the town, um, things like garbage receptacles, barriers, uh, that sort of thing to make sure that we have the space and the safety measures in place to properly host an event. Um, uh, other than that, uh, I guess we're willing to take whatever assistance or, or help that's, that's offered and, uh, and go from there. So, uh, like I said, the, the festival, uh, the day festival is going to be on March 24th. We're hoping um, to facilitate setup uh, and such, and to, to minimize uh, labor costs for the, the town, that we could see the road closure occur on uh, Friday uh, afternoon or evening to avoid any overtime. Um, and, then, uh, and then we can get to work at setting up and hopefully some, some picnic tables and, and garbage receptacles and things of that nature that we could work directly with staff to, to figure out details on um, would, be, uh, would be offered up and we could take things from there. So with that, I, uh, I think that's really all I, I'm here to, to kind of bring up. So any questions or, or comments or suggestions would be more than welcome. Hey, uh, Councillor Mike Myatt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I just wanted to thank you, Jeff, for your, your presentation. And I, I, I was one of the ones that attended that meeting, and there was close to 20 attended, and there was a lot of enthusiasm in that room, I agree. And uh, it's, a, it's a great thing that the Maple Syrup Festival is, is, not, is not going to disappear. And uh, you're more or less saving the event, and, and where, you know, whereas it's a one-day event, it's it's going to happen. So I think that's a good thing for Colta Park. I think we're doing it. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll and, be the location. And, and uh, Jeff, can you just give us um, just a little bit of a sneak preview in terms of you know the early you know early results of who who be involved, like Lions, who, who the breakfast, and some of the events, and music, and you can just give for the people listening at home. Um, could you, could you give us an idea what uh, some of the things are being planned? Uh, y yes, absolutely. It's the Lions Club who has generously uh, offered to come on board and execute the, uh, the pancake breakfast. Um, that's obviously part and parcel with any maple syrup festival. Um, so that, that's exciting. We're, we're dealing with an organization, a club, a service club that has a, a ton of experience and, and equipment uh, as well as volunteer power to, to execute here. We're also looking to draw on some of the same uh, events and successes that, that we paired with uh, things like the, the Easter um, uh, petting zoo and, and that sort of thing that, that's occurred at Coulter previously. Uh, we're looking to, to also draw upon some of the expertise and, and events and activities that were part of the uh, very successful Children's Festival that was hosted in, in downtown Port Elgin um, a couple of years ago. Uh, as well, um, we were very fortunate to have some volunteers that were, were instrumental in spearheading last year's uh, Snowfest come out and, and want to jump on board as well. So I think we're going to really try to tie in a lot of the activities, gear it uh, obviously towards kids and families, um, and, and have some, some entertainment. And, and, and really just, I, I think the, at the meeting, one of the things that, that, that I, I focused on, and I think that a lot of the, the folks there uh, focused on, was we don't really know what what shape or, or direction this event's going to, to take. 
I think, you know, many, many years ago, uh, Pumpkin Fest uh, started in, in a very similar way. And, and I think to try to, to try to give it too much um, structure uh, right off the hop, and we, we're not really sure um, what kind of festival the community wants, um, I, I think would be maybe a little premature. So I think we're going to draw on the activities and events from, from past successes, add a few new components, maintain some of the traditions that people have become you know, very familiar with and, and, and more than aware with, with the, the Conservation Authorities Festival. But, but I think it's also important to, to recognize that we can't possibly hope to recreate what, what was done in the past in, 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 the, in the bluffs. I mean, it was fantastic. And, and that's not what we're trying to do. We're, what we're trying to do is create a festival that is truly unique, a uh, set of activities uh, and events during a slower time of year um, in, in our community and, and bring people downtown and, and get some excitement going and, 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 and offer something for, for folks and families to do uh, in the middle of March. So I think that's, that's really the direction that we're, we're hoping to go. I just again like to thank you, Jeff, and, and, and to the members of the BIA and, and uh, downtown business. I know they're jumping on board quickly and uh, for helping to save this event because it's, uh, it's great to see it happening in Derry, right downtown Port Alga. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Minaj, then Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to, to Jeff, then, uh, are you set on, uh, on the name? Have you, have you been working on a name? I had the suggestion that it could be the, the March Maple Menagerie or something, you know, like... Uh, so I wondered if <laughs> things really do relax when there's no one out in the gallery. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I wondered if you was are you, are you set on that name or are you working on a name change? Um, I I don't think a ton of time has been put in thus far to to coming up with a specific name. I, I my sense is that that folks are likely quite open to whatever we might want to call it in the end. I think uh, right now we're we're really focused and and, and you would know from being. Um, part of the, the, the initial meeting and, and being part of the organizing committee that I think our thrust now has to be coming up with the, the, the details and, and, and executing this um, in a relatively short period of time, something that we're, we're accustomed to, but uh, as far as the name, I, I, I don't know. Councillor Dave Mayer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you also. Um, I, I, I too, uh, like to reiterate some of the thoughts around the room. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad you're doing it. It's been a fixture in my family since my kids were yeah. as old as your daughter is now, <laughs> and, uh, and they certainly look forward to that every year. It's kind of a signal that spring is just around the corner, and yeah. I'm glad it's going to go on. Um, have you? I, I know that uh, Soggy Valley hosted it for years and years, and, and a lot of the contingent and the, the people that were in, involved with that came out of the Paisley area. Are you getting any participation? I wasn't, unfortunately, able to... Uh, the inaugural meeting and but I'd like to be involved as going forward but have you been able to get reach out to some of them because they bring a, a unique flavor to it as well I'm thinking in particular like the the pioneer setups there there's a fellow Gerald Beach who has a sort of a portable fort that he really likes to set up and show off his, his skins and antique uh, pioneer days sort of tools and things and that yeah one of the first things we did when when discussions started and one of the very first people we contacted when, when talking about this was uh was shannon woods um of the uh the conservation authority uh and, and someone that we've worked with i guess uh last year or the year before i can't i can't quite remember to organize some busing and transportation from port elgin out to the festival itself so we we had already had a pre-existing relationship with with the organizers because of that and and like i said the very first people we contacted were were the, the organizers and the folks uh, most familiar with the festival, we made it clear that anything um, that they could offer to, to assist us um, in, in moving forward and, and kind of maintaining this tradition, we would be very open to, and, and they have been nothing short of fantastic. They have, they have um, offered a, a list of names, phone numbers, email addresses, contacts, people that have been traditionally involved in this festival, and, and whatever we can work with those folks where possible to make sure that, that the features and the activities they bring uh, and have brought in the past, that we can, we can move those into Port Elgin and, and have it as part of this festival, then, then we're absolutely committed to that. Yes. That's really good to hear, and, and I'm, I have no doubt in my mind it's going to be a tremendous success. There's so many young families in this mm -hmm. town, and I can see it turning into a two-day festival going to for future years. I, I can too. Thank you. Okay, well, best of luck to you. I just to say, uh, I'm sure our, our, our staff in the town here will be more than willing to provide you with any help we can, we can, Jeff. So by all means, get a hold of them, and uh, whatever your needs are, we'll make sure this is a success. Thank you very much. Thank you.
The next item on the agenda is a general government staff report. It has to do with the 2018 Council and Committee of the Whole meeting dates, and our clerk, Linda White, will present them. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the report before you has recommendations for changes to the meeting dates that conflict with the Roma Conference, Christmas, and the upcoming 2018 election. Those proposed changes are outlined in the recommendation. So the recommendation is that the 2018 meeting calendar be amended to reflect that the January 22nd meeting be rescheduled to January 29th, 2018, and the August 22nd, November 26th, and December 24th meetings be cancelled. Any discussion? All in favor? That's carried. So the next item on our agenda is uh, amendments. Staff report has to do with amendments to the Municipal Act and our procedural bylaw, and again, our clerk, Linda White, will present. Thank you. So this report identifies the changes to the Municipal Act that will be taken effect on January the 1st and that will affect our procedural bylaw. Uh, so the province has created a definition of meeting, which is before you. Um, they've also added four sections to the Municipal Act that will allow four additional reasons for going into closed session. And the vacancy um, provision has been expanded to allow a member to take up to 20 consecutive weeks off for the birth of a child or the adoption of a child without um, the seat being determined to be vacant or requiring a resolution of council. So those three items are being recommended for amending our procedural bylaw and incorporating them into the procedural bylaw. The last item on the report is with respect to electronic participation. If council so wishes to entertain the idea of uh, electronic meetings, then I've outlined in the report uh, different areas that would need your consideration. Thank you, Linda. Then there is a recommendation, and we'll put it on the floor. It's uh, recommended that the procedure by bylaw be amended to include the definition of meeting, additional closed session provisions provided by Section 239.1 of the Municipal Act, and vacant seat provisions provided in Section 259.1.1 of the Municipal Act. Any questions or comments to this? I'll start down here. Councillor Dave Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. For you. Uh, so... Linda, I, what I see this is that all of these are, are dictated by the Municipal Act changes with the exception of the electronic participation, which is, um, which is something that we may or may not do depending on the will of the Council. Is that right? Yes. Through you, Mr. Mayor, the Municipal Act that will, effective on January the 1st, enable Councils to choose whether they want to allow electronic meetings. So it's permissive. It's may. It's not shall. Right. So it's Council's decision. So... If we were to decide to move in that direction, would there be a request then required from us for you to come up with uh, how that might look and, and what, uh, whether it's video or whether it's audio or whether we can phone in a meeting or? That is correct. Virtual Dave sitting here or something? Yeah. Okay, so thanks for the clarity on that. Yep. Councilor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I actually would like to. Um, I think I'd like staff to investigate the um, issues involved with electronic participation. I know it's um, fairly widely used throughout municipalities in British Columbia, and um, I've been doing a little reading, and I know that uh, a number of municipalities are exploring uh, the option in Ontario, and I think it's worth a discussion on our part. So I don't know uh, if we need a formal motion on that or just... Uh, if they'd like to come back with a report? I think uh, the, the clerk's offered that in this package, so I think that's fine. We can just give her some direction to come back at a later date with some of the implications and how we might implement that. Is that fine? Okay, sure. Councilor Minaj. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think I, it's been asked and answered, but I, I'd like to just pose it to you this way then. If... if I wanted to support electronic participation. Would is that what? Do you need a re revision to this? Do you need a, a motion to say, add it to this report tonight to move forward to bring back how electronic participation would take place and have a seconder and then a vote, have a vote on it tonight? Or are you saying that staff will listen to our comments and bring back an option on it in the new year? I think that's, you know, that's what the three speakers have said, and I think the clerk has offered that, so that would be my suggestion that we come back with how you might implement that, what the implications are, and 
because there's going to be some costs and technology bumps, I'm sure, that to make it work. So uh, we'll leave it to the clerk to come back with a recommendation or, or, or with the implications and how it might be implemented. Okay. So any further questions, comments? Deputy Mayor Sharp. Just make, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I might just make a comment in furtherance of that. The, uh, I would like to see an option come forward which would um, envision implementation but limited to the committees and local boards uh, without council, a, a, an option that would um, sort of see a dry run at, the, at that level and see how it, would, how it plays out and then take a look at council at a later date. I guess I'd just like to see that as, a, as considered as an option when a report does come back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think that sure any further comments all in favor of the recommendation opposed to any that's carried so we go now to a staff report and that's the bill 148 and the part-time wage getting those implications and our CAO David Smith will present it uh, thank you very much mr. Mayor. And, and through you uh, Sarah Roth wasn't able to join us tonight she's become an, an aunt so those of you that that uh, for the first time those of you that may know Deb Roth is uh, together with uh, daughter and sister uh, the, the province of Ontario recently passed Bill 148, the Fair Workplaces Better Jobs Act. This legislation has far-reaching impact over time starting January 1st, 2018, with additional elements being phased in effective April 2018, and, and again, additional ones on January 1st, 2019. The most pressing change, and, and the reason for the report tonight, uh, is uh, the legislated changes to the minimum wage, effective January 1st. Uh, we do need Council's approval to implement our proposed wage grid. Council uh, may remember that we uh, had some discussion on this during our operating budget discussions, and we have allocated uh, money appropriately in the budget uh, to cover our recommended uh, uh, wage grid implementation. I, I do want to point out that the proposal does uh, maintain our pay equity uh, program. Um, so it's something that we've worked hard over a number of years to town to make sure that we have uh, fair and reasonable uh, uh, pay equity. Um, but I, I would also describe this wage grid as, as temporary. Um, effective April 1st, there are further changes. Um, weren't able to implement any of those because we're still uh, waiting for direction uh, from the province on, on what exactly those mean. And uh, until uh, the province uh, releases that information or clarifies some of the intent of that, uh, we're unable to implement or, or plan to implement them. So the recommendation, you have a, a, a proposed part-time employee wage grid. It meets our minimum wage requirements. It also does maintain our equity program. Thank you, David. And the recommendation is that Council approve the attached part-time employee wage grid. Questions or comments? Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I should have sent this as an electronic question, but um, one of the clauses um, adds a new domestic violence or sexual violence leave of absence, and it says up to 10 days off and up to 15 weeks of leave per year. Um, with the first five days paid for an employee or employee's child. Um, I'm assuming that means a child under 18. It doesn't specify that. I would have to circle back. I'm sorry, Councillor Grace. Mm -hmm. Mr. Merritt, have to circle back and, and uh, check that specifically, whether it's under 18. Councillor Dave Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you. Uh, when I when I read this, I, I see that obviously on uh, in a couple of weeks, on January first, two thousand and eighteen, we're going to see a increase in the minimum wage to fourteen dollars, and then the goes on to say that in a year's time, on January first, two thousand and nineteen, that uh, will be re that the minimum wage will increase to fifteen dollars an hour with other provisions. Um, I, when I read this, I thought, would it not be prudent to stick to the 2018 uh, changes? Because there is a federal, uh, provincial election coming up in 2018, and it's quite plausible that if a new government is formed other than a liberal government, that the 2019 change may or may not take place. <laughs> Hello? Sometimes it works. <laughs> 
But I think for clarity, that is included in the act, and the act has been has been passed. So, I mean, it would make a change. It would we're speculating on a change that may or may not happen with the new government. So it's, this is included in in Bill 148. These these requirements. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so we're recommending that the 2018 uh, uh, grid, not the, the 2019. At, at this point, uh, we suspect that the impact of April 1st changes will again change this. So in 19. It Okay, any further questions? Deputy Mayor Sherman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, through you to the CAO, I, I'm, I guess I'm, st I'm not entirely clear on the impact to pay equity um, or the comments about pay equity or how pay equity applies to these positions. The, um, as you can see, there's a number of positions there that in the year 2017 are above the, even above the proposed minimum wage for next year, right? They're getting paid up $21 an hour, right? So, um, and so what you're talking about is maintaining the separation that, they, that exists today into the future. But I still am not clear, are we talking equity between these positions? I guess, is that what you're saying? I just pay equity as kind of a, Kind of a fraught term, or it's got means a lot of different things. So I guess is that what you're referring to? You mean equity between these different positions, these positions on this list, or something broader? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, um, Council may remember uh, when we had the presentations related to, to uh, uh, pay equity um, earlier in the year. There's three types of pay equity. There's legislated pay equity, uh, which is is uh, related to gender. Uh, there's external. A market equity to make sure we're paying fairly uh, across uh, the market and then there's internal uh, pay equity uh, which uh, um, dictates the, the separation uh, between levels so um, is there the proper separation is is uh, is there a lack of compression uh, so the the um, the equity the pay equity that I'm, I'm referencing um, this context is not the legislated pay equity. It's the uh, a good practice pay equity. It's the, the pay equity for our internal um, separation. To use your term. May Mr. Mayor, then I w what I would suggest uh, over the course of 2018, um, once we've approved this grid and before we um, the next council approves the next grid. Uh, that we, since this is such a radical change, we're talking a 20% increase to these positions, right? A huge, really a massive one-year pay increase and then a massive one-year pay increase again next year. I feel like um, this could get thrown out of whack in terms of our, how we compare to other communities with these positions. I would, I would suggest that over the course of 2018, we should just take a look with these positions where we can and how they compare with other municipalities and make sure that we're not thrown out of line here, some I can tell you in the private sector, uh, separations are not going to be maintained. People who are making over uh, minimum wage today, over fifteen dollars an hour today, are likely not going to get a twenty percent increase in one year. Next year, They're, those those wage increases will be phased above that because nobody <laughs> it's, it's unaffordable, right? So, so I think that. Uh, um, we need to just assess ourselves against other municipalities to make sure that what they're doing, what we're doing here, in terms of those separations over the minimum wage, is consistent, and that we're we are competitive, and that we that our rates make sense. So I would like to see us do that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think that's your your external pay equity that he's talking about. I, I suspect the legislative pay equity that this will have very little impact on it because there would be none of those part-time jobs that would be comparators for. Actually, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, th I'm there is yeah, there is some some uh, 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 legislated pay equity. Pay equity uh, is a confusing topic, uh, but it is gender specific. And if there are jobs that are uh, uh, identified as female predominant, then they do need to meet legislated pay equity. So some of our, our daytime uh, lifeguard positions uh, would fall under the, the pay equity. So it's very complex, I, I think, and in, in to the, the Deputy Mayor's credit, um, it is something we need to address. A, a pay is, is significant for us. Um, I think when there's a more clarity about what the impact of, of April's changes are, uh, we'll be reviewing our, our entire uh, part-time structure. Okay, any further questions? All in favor of the recommendation? Really? That's carried. Is the next item on the agenda is uh, environmental services and staff 
the transportation staff report it has to do with winter operations and our director of public works and engineering Amanda Frosch will present the report Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, um, the recommendation is that Council approves the 2017-2018 Winter Operation Plan. Some highlights in the report about this plan is it was last brought to Council 2014-2015, and it was based on the regulation of the minimum maintenance standards. This uh, updated plan is being presented to you because of changes that we have made in operations over the last couple of years. Our level of service, I promise you, does meet the minimum maintenance standards and most often is exceeded. So during the week, you will see the eight centimeter minimum for the or maximum depth of snow and the time that you need to clear it. And our when our guys are here, that is done um, when it's needed and, and we don't wait for the eight centimeters. You see on weekends, the level of service is a little different. They, they make judgment calls on the second call out. So you'll have the guys called at three in the morning almost every day when there's snow on the ground. And then we use judgment to, to call them out again if needed on Saturday or Sunday, sorry. So the plan also defines our procedures and the equipments and the methods that our staff will utilize to meet these minimum maintenance standards. The changes this year it removed the pre-wedding process. They added the additional sidewalk plow in Port Elgin that uh, thankfully you guys approved previously from the development charges. It also helps uh, clearly show the alleys that we do maintain so that that has a document that we can take back to the public that shows clearly if their alley is maintained or not. And those alleys and lanes are plowed uh, based on the class one, class two. I just want to highlight that as a different class than the class one and two in here. This is MTO mandated class one and two, which are provincial highways. Our class one and class two in our zoning bylaw defines if it's winter maintained or not winter maintained. So an asphalt road like Waterloo or Wellington would be the, the class one road that gets plowed, whereas there's some lanes that are just gravel that would be class two and they, in that plan, do not get plowed. So there is no financial impact. This has worked into our operation budget for winter control and the new plow has been pre-approved and no additional staff are required. Thank you, Amanda. And the recommendation that council approves the 2017-2018 winter operations plan. There. Councillor Mike Myatt, no, get over there. Just point of clarification through you to our Director of Public Works. Man, I'm just wondering, um, I understood that uh, from a sidewalk plow standpoint that, I don't know if this information from uh, some time ago, but one sidewalk plow, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, one sidewalk plow per 10 kilometers is the figure I always uh, always understood and as the number of you know the, the uh, number of meters of sidewalk increases if it reaches that threshold towards another 10 kilometers we had a sidewalk plow and you get to 30 and another the report states 48.12 kilometers of, um, of sidewalk do we have three sidewalk plows or four I think we have three correct is that correct and and is that how does that equate Are you, with three plows 48.12 Am I accurate with my one sidewalk plow per 10 kilometers? So the numbers are a little confusing to me. Through you, Mr. Mayor, if you turn to page 26, you'll see the sidewalk routes for Port Elgin. And I'll use that as an example. So we have four sidewalk plows, one in Southampton and three in Port Elgin. And because of efficiencies in how you turn around with the plow, the plows do more than 10, so they, the one of them does 12, one does 11.85, another one does 12.68. So that's how you get up to the 48. But when we look at budgeting for a new plow, we use 10 as the threshold as to when we would want to order a new one. So that helps to clarify. So we're at 4, 48. It's not mean to say that after another 1.88 kilometers of sidewalk being added, we'll be adding another sidewalk plow. That's not the case because they double back. So that's sort of... Stand now. Thank you. That's correct. Councillor Grace. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, first of all, Amanda, I want to thank you for this updated report. And um, I think our staff always does such a great job with winter maintenance. And this really um, gives people details and gives us details on what it takes to do that. Um, I do have a specific question for you about High Street in Southampton. Um, and uh, I've received a number of um, questions and comments from residents, some residents who are concerned about the uh, new bump outs on the section between Grosvenor and Huron and how 
our winter maintenance will be affected by those. So I wondered if you could just explain. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, we talked to operations when the design was prepared and understood that the center boulevard of snow would need to be changed in the blocks as we add in the bump outs. So the snow storage will be towards the parking stalls. They'll store the snow in there and the driving lanes will remain driving lanes instead of how it's on the other two blocks where the driving lanes become plow la or plowed snow piles and the parking spots become the driving lanes. Uh, it means that we may be out with a loader more often, clearing that off. I actually got a, an email this morning saying thank you for quickly removing the loader pile that was already on High Street. Um, the other two blocks will remain with the center piles until those bump outs are put back. One thing we did uh, recognize too is that the plow driver has been doing that same route for a very long time. So we put stakes, I don't know if you've noticed those, with painted on the top so that they're clearly visible in the snow. That will be both added safety for drivers that have been driving the same road for many years and for our plows to make sure that the curbs are safe. Councillor Dave Mayette, then we'll go to Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Once again, through you. Uh, my question is also regarding the sidewalk plowing and uh, I, I believe that all of us, uh, and yourself included, may have got some correspondence from at least one concerned resident about the sidewalk plows. And I know about the width of the sidewalk plow, and I know that uh, different sidewalks in the town have been upgraded to the, the more standard width, but we still have in some areas the more narrow width. And the sidewalk plows, uh, I believe, are, are gauged for the wider width, and when they go down the road, they tear up chunks of lawn and... Uh, People take a lot of pride in their properties. Is there any way that we can work around this to satisfy these people that uh, their lawns aren't going to get uh, mangled? Is there a way we can angle the plow or use a different apparatus or, or something for these areas? Through you, Mr. Mayor. The problem, the biggest problem is that right now the ground is soft. So it's like scooping butter when it goes by. So as the winter progresses, we end up using the blower more often as well. And so there's a lot less damage. But right now there's light snow so we're using the blade the blade is the width it's it's on an angle so it's as best as they can they also don't have any banks to help guide them so everything is white in the same level so it's very hard to find the sidewalk as they're going through we do have an annual budget in the operations budget to go out and repair so the guys go out in the spring and they add topsoil and seed for those those repair jobs so when someone calls in and makes a complaint their name goes in the SRM, and then it's under a tag called plow damage. We pull those up in the spring, and we go repair. Well, that's that's very good good news and a good answer there. So what you're saying is these plow machines, you can either put the blade or the blower. They come with both. They say, okay, as the winter grows on. Yeah, I've noticed the same thing with my own snow blower as I'm shooting lots of turf out through the chute as well this time of year. So, okay, thanks, and, and congrats to our uh, – Congrats to all the this hard working staff that get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to maintain our roads and sidewalks. Councillor Manaj. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have um, three, I think, three things I'd like to ask Amanda. And one of them is <clears throat> it's, no, it's no secret that Port Algonites and some Southamptonites like to use. 10th concession to the Dahl Side Road, the Dahl Side Road to, to uh, the 14th concession that goes past the landfill site, right? And comes in Carlisle and back in High Street to get to the get to the uh, the hospital. In fact, my life was saved because we used that route when the road was closed once upon a time. So I tried to see the, the uh, night patrol and it looked like the night patrol did not go out on the Dahl side road. So is there an opportunity uh, to either correct me and say, yes, it does, or could we add some sort of uh, ability if Highway 21 gets closed and we assume the shore road is probably just as bad that we know the Dahl side road is a good option to get from one community to the hospital. And I'm talking really, I know other people want to use it to get home because they're, they're maybe down south and they've been able to get all the way from King Carden into Port Elgin and they can still get home to Southampton. But in particular about 
access to the hospital is what I was considering. Can we match up these routes and these patrol schemes with the hospital in mind is, is my first question. Um, <clears throat> my second question is, is uh, do we have um, a mutual aid type approach if the county system and the provincial uh, plows aren't able to to get out because of dire straits weather that we could still maybe patrol and do uh, there's a number of roads right Bruce County Road 3 17 25 33 40 in the township line are all around our community and they are usually taken care of by the county and, and the province so if those Ministry of Transportation so if if they can't get out there and and look after those roads but we could is it something that we could feasibly add to the, to the program just a thought and then my last one is uh, to do with the um, the sixth concession Bruce County Road 25 stoplight and I realize that it's not your mandate to change controls of the st of the stoplight but we've brought this up year over year and yet I cannot read where we will have a policy or a procedure that will change the light in the event that Highway 21 is closed and it's desperately needed to keep people safe and doing the right thing and, and what I'm suggesting is that we either go to a four-way amber light system or a four-way red light system flashing red light system whenever we close 21 highway at Bruce County Road 25 is that something that we could get into a policy statement thank you Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll touch on each of them. <clears throat> so the night shift road patrol is just when someone's going out to look at road conditions. It has, it's not someone going out and plowing. So the ones that are identified uh, in, on the map in Magenta are roads that we know indicate the, the condition of the other roads. So North Shore Road, Miramichi Bay, that's a road that gets a lot of snow blown on, so it's on the list. Concession 2 and the Bruce Sogging, same thing snow blows in there so that's where these maps are, are out so when they're going down Carlisle they'll still know that the doll whether it needs to or not because the conditions are considered the same so then during the day um, it the roads are patrolled um, it's a more roads are patrolled by the the crews that are out there knowing what's there so it's just say um, they see that the roads are bad on Carlisle and high then they call in the crews to come and plow based on the priorities Does that make it make sense and the, the mutual aid when the county can't plow their roads they close the road so I'm not sure what it would mean if we're going to try to work that out but we are not allowed to drive on on county roads so I would think we would have to work or on closed roads so we would have to work that through um, what our what it would mean by our plows going on their their closed roads because they're not ours it's different when we close a road and our plows go down I can look into that so the one that comes to mind is and I realize I'm 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 being picky here to a point but I don't know where Bruce County Road 17 would be closed vis-a-vis uh, -vis we're going we've approved a plan of subdivision and a sidewalk that's going to go across the, the end of Gustavus Street so I don't know where you would put the closed signs up but it's conceivable that if we close Bruce County Road 17 that we could still plow plow a portion of it to allow people to get to to those homes if in fact they are here and those homes are built but that would be one example there are other examples obviously that I've already mentioned those those roads um, for your interest through you Mr. Mayor um, when the bridge is closed for that reconstruction the town will be plowing um, from the bridge to Highway 21 for the county because otherwise they would have to bring their plows all the way around Bruce Road 40 and in so I do know that we work together I just don't know how if they've closed a road due to condition how we would work that out. but I can follow that up with uh, Brian for sure then what about the stop light on concession 6 and 25 I know that our staff has had those conversations with the MTO and they've come back in the negative that we cannot change the light due to that road closure we have an agreement with them on how to operate that light but it's something that I, again I can I can reach out to MTO and ask the question another time 
Vice Deputy Mayor Huber. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's about um, sidewalk plowing, and it's particular to the Southampton map. Um, I'm not too sure that um, I'm, well, I'm confident you've updated the map, but I do think that we do the sidewalk plow down the stretch of Adelaide from Albert Street, the highway, down to Huron Street now. Um, and if we don't, um, it, I think it got plowed almost all the time last year by our plow. So um, that would be a good line if it is actually happening to get on the map. I wanted to ask, though, about the potential to, um, in the future, consider there's a one-block stretch on Palmerston Street between Grosvenor and, and the highway. There is a sidewalk on the south side of, of Palmerston Street there. And, um, you know, it's just kind of hanging there. And the other one that's just kind of hanging there is between, is on Spence Street, which is not actually marked on the map, but um, it's Spence Street between um, the highway, Albert Street and Victoria Street. It's, it's the street that comes down to where the Tim Hortons is in Southampton. Those would be two one-block sections that would be great to have um, the opportunity to get them on the list in the future. I did want to comment, too, because um, it comes up every winter. Quite a few, the highway gets plowed um, more often than a lot of other streets through Southampton. And so, um, you know, we do great jobs on the sidewalk, and then it almost seems like, you know, a half hour later, <laughs> the highway plows along and it's throwing stuff over onto the sidewalk. So they're, they're, they're not always um, in the best condition. But one of the areas that's particularly difficult on the sidewalks along Highway 21 along Albert Street is a, a lot of the intersections, the grade changes, so there's there's sort of a ramp down to the road, and then on the other side you ramp up to go back up on the sidewalk. And the way that the snow, um, the sidewalk plow works, it, it tends to lift and lower the blade so that there's always massive piles of snow um, at quite a few of the intersections, which, um, you know, you got to climb over it to get. So I know that they often carry shovels and stuff on the plows. I happen to be in Own Sound today and I actually saw one of their sidewalk plows, you know, hop off, plow operators hop off and do a little shoveling. There's a couple of intersections along the highway in particular that are really bad with the, the grade change um, from the sidewalk to the, to the road. And um, it would be great if whoever is um, operating the plow, if, you know, they might notice um, the first couple times that it happens and see where it's the worst and maybe um, just try, if they can, to correct some of those. But um, I do think Adelaide is getting plowed now for your map, but the block on Palmerston and the block on Spence would be additional. And the, the sidewalk on Spence is just on the south side of the road, too. So that section of Palmerston, that section of um, Spence, they only have sidewalks on one side, and it's on the south side, both of them. Thank you. Councillor Mike, my if I may ask one follow-up, uh, there was a vice deputy mayor mentioned a few n names of a few sidewalks. I, I uh, maybe Buckby could be added to the list too, but uh, I did have a call from a resident asking the question about uh, you know how how do they get on the sidewalk plowing list for for Buckby Street, and I said, well, when the t when the appropriate time comes, I'll raise the question. So I'll raise it tonight. A uh, question I have to you, Mr. Mayor, to the director is. Uh, relating to that, of how you get onto the sidewalk plowing list, do you, from time to time, Amanda, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, with the sidewalk master plan, plowing master plan, when you know, when's that review done? Is it is it annually? Is it coming? Um, how, how are new sidewalks added? Uh, what 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 basis do you use, um, you know, for for adding a new sidewalk to the list? Through you, Mr. Mayor, it's through service requests. So when somebody calls in and um, or enters and gets a service request in to have their street added to the list, it's put on a spreadsheet. And when that number hits 10, like right now, Southampton's at 850 meters as requests for streets. There's not much on it. So we just don't foresee it happening anytime soon. But we, um, Len was monitoring the last couple of years, Port Elgin, because it was creeping up quickly to have that request. Being that... Like, are you saying like the, the squeaky wheel, like service request, meaning, the, you mean the number of people call in as a service request would, would help to determine whether a, a new section of sidewalk was added? Is that what you're saying to me, Amanda? It's true, Mr. Mayor, that's what I'm saying. So if someone was to call and ask for Trillium to be put on the list and they, they tell us that their kids have to walk a certain distance to the bus stop and they really would appreciate their sidewalk being plowed, then that gets on the list. We get the same number of calls. I had the same number of calls complaining about their sidewalks being plowed today as people complaining that their sidewalks weren't plowed today. So um, when there's requests come in, it's the easiest way to judge. Putting okay. 
Okay. No further questions, and I'll call the vote. All in favor of the recommendation? That's carried. Thank you, Amanda. So the next item on the agenda then is uh, communications petitions for committee to hold information. There's, I can leave four items there. Yeah, there is. And the next item is reported department heads. There's two items there. One's our <coughs> allergy aware, aware program, and the second one is the uh, Ontario Municipal Board decision on 510 Market Street. Councillor Grace. Um, I have a question about the OMB decision report, and um, it's actually uh, referring to the bylaw, I guess. Okay, so my question is about the, the drawing. Um, that is provided to us in the decision. Um, it doesn't show a two-story building. Um, and what I want clarified is um, the bylaw as it reads in this um, report. Um, it doesn't specifically address height in its list of requirements. Um, what it does say is the facade treatment uh, of the semi-detached dwelling uh, shall be substantially in accordance with the document entitled Elevation Option 2, attached to Schedule B. So that's the drawing of the, of the um, building as it's supposed to be built. Um, I guess what I'm, I'm wondering about is... Um, does the town have some kind of guarantee that the proposed height will not be increased? Is there, um, is there something, I mean, I guess that's my first question. Is, is this report in fact saying to us that this structure will look like the picture that's in this report? you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the first paragraph of the second item there, it says the principal dwelling shall be a semi-detached bungalow only. So a bungalow, so it's one story. And yes, it is saying that the schedule B, the drawing, um, that has to be complied with. So the facade treatment. So when the building inspector or the chief building official gets the building permit application, he will be reviewing the elevation option two that's attached to the zoning bylaw. No further questions. We'll take a motion to adjourn. Councillor Madison and Councillor Rich. All in favor, we'll adjourn for five minutes. We don't